Welcome back, everyone. Before we conclude this module, I just want to share a few final thoughts about blockchains. The first thing that's really important to remember is that a blockchain is not always the right application for storing data. Yeah, so a blockchain is a really good tool whenever you need to, whenever you need to have the ability to verify publicly all the transactions that are being issued in your system, and when centralization is not an option. Yeah, in particular, if you're in a situation where you don't want to trust a single party or a small number of parties for persistence and liveness, then uh, that's, the, that's the case where you should be using a blockchain. If one of these is not really true, you don't need a blockchain. Really, what you need is a database or maybe in some cases what's called a distributed database. It's really important to remember that a blockchain is the right solution only for certain types of data. Uh, for most data, a database or a distributed database are perfectly fine. So that's the first thing to remember. Don't always jump to uh, proposing blockchain as a solution. The second uh, thought I want to make sure is clear is that data, we talk about data on the blockchain, but really data is not typically on the blockchain. Most of the time, the blockchain is just used to authenticate data. So what do I mean by that? Really, if you have a large document, you don't really want to put that large document on the blockchain because the blockchain gets replicated all over the world and it would just be causing uh, a lot of storage headaches for a lot of people all over the world. Instead, what we typically do is we compute a hash of the large document. Maybe the large document is like a couple of megabytes big. We just compute this short hash. Remember, these are 32 byte uh, hashes. And we only put the hash on the blockchain. The point is, that now, um, once the document is presented to someone, anyone can verify its authenticity by just looking that the correct hash is uh, 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 stored on the blockchain. So the blockchain itself sort of stores hashes. It typically does not store actual uh, document values. That's the second point to remember. The third point I want you to remember is that uh, there are issues with blockchain scaling. So in fact, on the main blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on, uh, the transaction rate is not where we would want it to be. And a good example of this is when the CryptoKitties applications launched, we talked about CryptoKitties earlier, when it launched, it was so popular that in fact, the transaction rated rate that was generated just by the CryptoKitties contract, um, already that exceeded the throughput that Ethereum can, uh, can support. So if you want to read about what happened there, there's a good, there's a good overview in this story that I, that I uh, mentioned here, that I cite here, you can look this up. Um, but effectively, uh, you know, the tr transaction rate was so high just from this one dApp that no one could issue transactions uh, for a while on the blockchain. Yeah, so, so this shows that scaling really is kind of an important issue for these, uh, for these blockchains. And so let's just look at some numbers. Um, if you look at the Visa network, Visa can handle a roughly, you know, 1,600 transactions per second. The PayPal network, that's just US-based, can handle around 130, 193 transactions per second. In comparison, you know, the large, the large blockchains are much, much, much slower. And as a result, um, you know, this is why we see this contention in transaction rates when kind of a very popular application launches. Now, I have to say there are lots and lots of, there's a lot of work on scaling blockchains. And in fact, new blockchain designs aim to support much, much, much higher rates. Um, but it turns out that even the traditional blockchains like Bitcoin and the classic Ethereum can also uh, be made to scale. So let me say a few words about that. Um, so there are many proposed solutions for just scaling Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, one example is something called a Lightning, Lightning Network for Bitcoin and Plasma for Ethereum. This is really quite a beautiful idea in that what happens is most transactions are executed off the main chain. Yeah, so the main Bitcoin chain or the main Ethereum chain kind of progress at their slow rates, but then most of the transactions don't even touch those main chains. So it doesn't really matter if those transactions, if those chains are slow, given that most transactions happen off chain. Yeah, so the idea here is basically when you initialize a uh, kind of the virtual chain or when you exit from this virtual chain, or when there's problem, where, this, where this, there's disagreement between parties, this is when you need to hit the main chain. But in most cases, 
where the system kind of works without any problems or the system has already been initialized and people just issue transactions, most of the transactions just happen peer to peer and they never really touch the main chain. So if you want to read a bit more about how this works, you can look up the Lightning Network. It's actually quite easy to understand how Lightning works. Um, Plasma is also quite a beautiful design. Um, so that's one approach for scaling. Yeah, the way we scale is simply we don't touch the main, we touch the main chain as little as possible. So that's one idea. And the second idea is sharding, which is basically to split up the blockchain into multiple partitions. Each partition is called a shard. Uh, and so there are lots of designs uh, for sharding. The difficulty uh, that happens with sharding is when you need to move um, value from one shard to another, that's where kind of complications happen because now you need to talk between different partitions of the blockchain. And, you know, there are some um, uh, interesting complications that come up in making that work. Yeah, so, but anyhow, these are proposals that are specifically designed for scaling up Bitcoin and Ethereum. As I said, there are other more recent blockchains that are being proposed that actually scale inherently can handle hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. So in the long run, the scaling issue uh, is likely not going to be a problem. Okay, the last thing I want to say is that uh, this topic is vast. I hope I kind of gave you a sense of the different areas of this topic, basically from mining, from consensus protocols, from managing crypto assets and by the end user. Uh, there are many, many, many topics in this area, and we kind of only covered a little bit of each topic, kind of only the tip of the iceberg. It's a fascinating area. I really love it. Uh, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of uh, deep scientific questions happening here. Um, if you want to learn more, we offer a complete course on blockchains. It's called CS251. Um, anyone can sign up. Uh, I, I, read, I wrote the instructions here. Um, if you are interested in reading more about how these blockchains work, there's a, nice, there's a very nice book on Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies available on Amazon. It's written by um, uh, you know, well-respected academics in the space. Um, and so that's another uh, source for information. And then I've, I've also given you a bunch of sources throughout the lecture that you can look up more material on your own. And everything I've, I've listed is self-contained and is something that you can actually spend a few minutes and read and kind of get a better sense uh, uh, on your own. So I hope you do look into some of the material in a bit more detail. As I said, it's really uh, interesting and kind of a fun, uh, fun area. So I hope to see you uh, get into it and uh, good luck with the further studies. And I will see you at the future modules for this course. So we'll stop here and thank you very much.